Hi, welcome to ESI 412 Nanotechnology, Materials, Infrastructure, and Safety. I am Professor Ukjun Nam at the Pennsylvania State University, and I will teach this course. This is the first unit, uh, General Perspectives, and Professor Steve Fonesh at the Pennsylvania State University uh, will teach the first three lectures. And in lecture one, we discussed general safety awareness, wet chemistry safety, and gas safety. In lecture two, we discussed biological safety and nanomaterial safety. And in lecture three, we're going to discuss energy safety and environmental concerns. And energy safety will be our first topic in this lecture three. Well, energy safety talks about problems that can occur, safety issues that can occur uh, with the use of different energy sources. And we discussed in our previous lectures the fact that there's a lot of stored energy in gas cylinders, and that could be dangerous. We talked about the fact that that energy, if improperly released, could turn a gas cylinder into a rocket which of course we don't want. Um, but there's uh, a, a rather ubiquitous energy source, even more uh, uh, potentially, uh, more of a potential problem because it is so ubiquitous and that is uh, the electrical energy sources that one finds in a nanofabrication facility. So these kinds of energy, the electrical energy sources, are associated with equipment that's used uh, that has AC power, for example, or radio frequency power, uh, and that radio frequency power can produce radiation. Uh, it can be an equipment that uses microwave power, and of course again produces radiation. It can be UV radiation and infrared radiation. So these sources of energy uh, owe their initial origins to some electrical uh, source, generally speaking, uh, and uh, the AC power being the obvious electrical source, but also RF, microwave, UV, and IR, uh, generally having uh, uh, an electrical source that causes them also. So there are, in general, electrical hazards uh, that come from the AC power or DC power. So let's put the radiation aside the UV, the IR, and let's talk about just electrical hazards per se coming from AC or even DC power sources. So there's a lot of uh, uh, use of electrical power in a nanofabrication facility and generally the voltages that are used are between 115 and up to 440 volts, so a lot of voltage. Uh, and uh, there is some equipment that can be used in some facilities, such as an ion implanter, that can actually generate thousands of volts uh, DC, direct current type of voltage, so a voltage that doesn't change with time. These voltages obviously are extremely dangerous. They can cause electrical shock and thereby possible death uh, by electrocution. So we have to think about the AC power sources and the DC power sources in a nanofabrication facility, be it a laboratory or a, a manufacturing site, and we have to think about some basic electrical safety precautions. And here's a list of some basic precautions. Uh, number one, never block access to the electrical power or the control panels. So always make sure that the control panels are uh, known, their position is known, and they're accessible. And when one is working in a situation where there's electrical power, uh, AC or DC, make sure to remove all jewelry, watches, and other metallic objects before working with equipment. For obvious reasons, these things, jewelry, watches, uh, are conductors. And one should wear shoes 
that have non-conducting souls. Uh, and when dealing with uh, electrical power, DC or AC. And one should never work alone on equipment where there is power applied. In general, it's always good to work on a buddy system where there's someone else there that can help if some problem were to arise. And uh, always keep the work area free of tools and debris. Uh, the worst thing can be to have things in the way, the things that can cause um, accidents as one has to move quickly or make decisions quickly. And never attempt to catch a dropped tool uh, wait, because you don't know where, what it might hit. Wait for it to land, see where it is, and retrieve it if it's in a safe location. So these are some basic precautions that one should exercise when dealing with DC and AC electrical power. Now, there can be fires that arise because of electrical power sources, and uh, there's some basic rules to follow in this case. Uh, generally, every piece of equipment should have an emergency off button. It should be a button, a power switch, or some kind of circuit breaker to remove power from the affected equipment. Uh, so you should obviously uh, use that off button or circuit breaker to turn the equipment off if there is a fire. And all fires should be reported to the appropriate safety authority. Uh, and if it's small, uh, one can attempt to extinguish the fire with a Type C fire extinguisher. But uh, there's an admonishment that must be stressed, and that's why you see it here in red. Never use water to try to put out an electrical fire. So that's something that, you know, your instincts may say, get some water. That's something you absolutely cannot do. And if the fire can't be easily controlled, or if there's fumes being generated, you need to evacuate the facility, be it a laboratory or a manufacturing facility. Now, electrical shock. This is where, again, the use of electrical power, AC or DC, uh, can cause uh, 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 damage, can actually cause death. So this is very uh, uh, important area of concern when one is using electrical power, be it AC or DC. Uh, so in case of electrical shock accident, uh, use the emergency off button power switch or circuit breaker that we talked about before to immediately remove power from the affected equipment. Don't touch the victim. Notify the appropriate safety authority and or call for medical assistance. So there should be some safety authority in the laboratory or facility. Notify that person and get medical assistance as needed if there's a shock, if someone has been exposed to or has suffered a shock. Probable effects of shock are listed here. And uh, we're talking about a one second duration that's the shock event only lasting one second and a hand to foot exposure. And we're talking about 60 cycle uh, uh, alternating current type of shock. So if we look at this type of shock, we can see, again, this is only for uh, one second duration. We can see what sorts of things can happen. If the current level is one milliamp, so we're talking about milliamps, abbreviated MA. So if the current that passes, uh, that is passing in that one second duration is one milliamp, uh, then the probable effect of the human body uh, is a slight tingling sensation. It's still dangerous under certain conditions. For example, if, any, if the person has some medical situations, uh, that kind of sh shock, even though it's only perceived as a slight tingling, uh, it can be dangerous in a, uh, depending on the medical situation. Now, if, if the current flowing in that one second duration is a five milliamp current, uh, then the shock is, is more 
pronounced to the individual. It's not painful, but it is disturbing. And the average individual will let it go. Uh, they won't be that upset about it. However, you can get strong involuntary reactions to shocks in this range that may lead to injuries. As we all know, muscle tissue reacts to electrical stimulation. So this kind of current is enough of a stimulation uh, to cause involuntary reactions. And those in themselves can lead to trouble uh, in addition to the, the, the shock itself. Now, if the current level is up at the 60 to 30 milliamp range in that one second, um, the shock can be painful. And the current is at such a level that muscular control is lost. And this is caused, called the freezing current or let go range. In other words, you just completely lose muscular control and uh, you could drop things or you just don't have control over your muscles anymore in a current in this range. And of course, uh, uh, for this 6 to 30 milliamp range, the 5 milliamp range, all the things that we said for the 1 milliamp range obviously apply. Uh, it, these can be extremely dangerous to people who have certain medical conditions. Now in the 50 to 150 milliamp range, the pain from the shock itself in this one second event can be extreme. Breathing can be affected, so there can be respiratory arrest, and there can be severe, severe muscular contractions. And the individual can actually, if you're holding something, your hands can freeze and you can't let it go. And uh, death is certainly possible at this current range. By the way, I think it's clear to everyone looking at this table that the, uh, the measure of the severeness of electrical shock is, is gained by looking at the current, not necessarily the voltage, but it's really the current that flows. It's the current that does the damage. If we go to up to the 1,000 to 4,300 milliamp range, so we make quite a jump here, this is really a severe situation. You have ventricular fibrillation, that is the ryth rhythmic pumping of the heart ceases. And you have muscular contraction all over the body and nerve damage can occur. As we know, the nerves work by electrical signals and uh, those electrical signals go to the muscles. So we've been affecting the muscles up to now. Uh, these signals, this 1,000 to 4,300 milliamp current range is so uh, high from the point of view of the body that it can actually also uh, damage the nerves. So death is very likely. If we jump up to the 10,000 milliamp current range, then we have cardiac arrest, severe burns, and probable death. Now you see the, uh, the OSHA site uh, source for this, and we've mentioned OSHA in several of uh, occasions in our previous lectures. Uh, OSHA, of course, is the government agency that develops these sorts of standards, these sorts of uh, evaluations of situations, and uh, you can go to that site for more information. But the, the points that uh, I'd like you to take away from this table are the fact that the current is really what we have to worry about. And even for one second, you can have some significant uh, damage, significant uh, trauma that occurs even in very, very low current ranges. And we're talking about milliamps here, not amps, but milliamps. So electrical current, electrical power sources, AC or DC, have to be very carefully watched, very uh, carefully used. We've discussed uh, electrical energy in the form of AC power and DC power and its dangers, but el electrical energy can also be used to produce electromagnetic radiation. We mentioned this early on in this lecture. 
So electrical energy can be can cause the emission and propagation of electrical and magnetic energy in the form of rays or waves. Uh, this rays and waves are equivalent terminology that we use for this form of electrical energy. Now many pieces of equipment generate radiation, again originating from some electrical source, and so in nanotechnology processing, one often encounters of this electromagnetic radiation. So here's some examples of tools that you'll find in a, in a nanofabrication facility, laboratory, or manufacturing facility. Uh, here's some, this is some tools that definitely have to be watched and uh, it must be understood that these tools can give off electromagnetic radiation. One uh, commonly found tool uh, which is a source of electromagnetic radiation, is the class of plasma tools. These are tools that use a plasma, a soup of negative particles and positive particles created somehow with an electrical source. Uh, they use this soup in some processing application. And we'll be discussing that as we get further into our topic of nanofabrication. But uh, these plasmas for now, since we're thinking very seriously about safety issues, we look at these plasmas as a source of electromagnetic radiation uh, that we have to be aware of and concerned about. Another source of electromagnetic radiation is the photolithography tools that one finds in a nanofabrication facility. Now photolithography, lithography means uh, to write well, graphene means to write, litho means stone, photo means light, so it's writing in stone with light, but you're not writing in stone, you're writing on a piece of glass, silicon, piece of plastic, you're trying to transfer some pattern. And usually, uh, you want to transfer a pattern in some very controlled way, and light is often used. Again, we'll get into pattern transfer in a great deal of detail later, but uh, uh, here we're talking about doing pattern transfer with light, photolithography, and so light is involved. Light is a type of electromagnetic radiation, and uh, so we have to worry about exposure to light that is found in many, many tools in, in, the in a nanofabrication facility, including the photolithography tools. Now, ellipsometers or another tool that is found in nanofabrication laboratories and manufacturing sites. Ellipsometers are used to measure thickness. So we talked about plasma tools which are used to, to fabricate things, photolithography which is used to transfer patterns. Now we're talking about ellipsometers which are used to characterize, to measure things. And these use light. They use light of, of over a very a large range and so, again, light being electromagnetic radiation, one must realize that these two are sources of this type of radiation that we have to be aware of and we have to uh, uh, consider its safety implications. Another characterization tool that uses light is this FTIR tool. So it's a characterization tool. The letters stand for Fourier transform infrared, and then uh, it's a type of spectroscopy. The S is missing, but you see the FT and the IR. This is the way this tool is commonly referred to. IR is infrared, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So once again, you have uh, um, electromagnetic radiation present, and we have to be aware of that and think of its safety implication. There are many other types of spectroscopy tools that can be in the laboratory uh, that also can be sources of electromagnetic radiation. There's Raman spectroscopy, for example. Uh, we'll be talking about these in the course Engineering Science 216 where we get into characterization. But one must be aware at this point that there's lots of different tools that use light 
light is a type of electromagnetic radiation, and we must be uh, aware of its safety considerations and its safety implications. Now, laser-based tools, these can be used in characterization. For example, Raman spectroscopy uses a laser. And these tools can also be used in processing. One way of cutting uh, materials is to use a laser scriber. So lasers can be found in nanofabrication facilities and nanofabrication manufacturing sites, both as processing tools uh, and as part of characterization tools. Now lasers are a tool that produces electromagnetic radiation. Again, the light, it produces light, and that light can be somewhere in the visible, even into the ultraviolet uh, range, and uh, it can be dangerous. So all of these are sources, uh, are examples of sources of electromagnetic radiation, uh, examples that are found commonly in a nanofabrication facility. So this is electromagnetic radiation produced electrically and its origin comes to some electric source. For example, the laser is driven electrically. The FTIR has a, a source that powers a, a light source. The photolithography has a light source. You, very often a mercury lamp. And the plasma is driven electrically. It's created electrically. So these sources owe their origins, origins to some, uh, or these phenomena, these tools, uh, and their use of light, uh, the, uh, the light itself, the electromagnetic radiation, uh, owes its uh, initial origin to some electrical source. Again, in the case of plasma, the plasma is produced by the electric power source. The plasma is this soup. This plasma can emit electromagnetic radiation. Photolithography, light is used, so there's electromagnetic radiation. Rhipsometer, some type of light is used, generally a range, so you have electromagnetic radiation. FTIR, another example, light is used over in the infrared range. Again, electromagnetic radiation. Spectroscopy tools, like a Raman spectroscopy tool, again, light is used. Um, and again, electromagnetic radiation. Laser, light is used. Light is electromagnetic radiation. So we have to be very aware of electromagnetic radiation in nanofabrication facilities. So there's lots of uh, types of electromagnetic radiation that are used in a nanofabrication facility. I've mentioned some of these already. Now let's just go over them again. Uh, radio frequency, uh, radiation, that often uh, is found in plasmas along with visible light radiation coming from plasmas, but you often have a radio frequency. You also have microwave frequencies that can be found in tools, especially, again, plasma generating tools. You have radiation coming from lasers. Uh, again, we, we mentioned uh, the frequent use of laser, lasers in various applications. You have UV light uh, found, uh, for example, in photolithography tools. You have infrared light, also found in many uh, uh, types of tools. So these are, this is an example of the kinds of electromagnetic radiation that can be found in a nanofabrication facility. Now we have to talk about some physics here when we talk about electromagnetic radiation. Um, radiation uh, has to be thought of as both a wave and as a particle. It's the way we understand radiation, that is, the way we understand radiation is sometimes we have to think of it in terms of its wave properties, and sometimes we have to think of it in terms of its particle type properties. The particles, by the way, is, or are called photons. So you'll hear people talk about pho photons. Uh, the frequency of the waves is very important. These different types of waves have different frequencies. And so if we look at that list above, RF waves have, um, in that list, they have one of the lower frequencies. Uh, UV waves have very high frequencies, for example, in that list. So the frequency of the wave 
is very important, and uh, the energy of the photon is very important. The energy of the photon is important because more energetic photons can cause more damage in the human body. So energetic photons, if they're energetic enough, they can break bonds in DNA, and that can lead, obviously, to a great deal of problems. So the photon is something we need to think about when we talk about energy. The frequency is something we think we need to think about when we talk about the waves. But these two things are very intimately related. Now, the electromagnetic spectrum is a very uh, rich spectrum. <clears throat> as, uh, as we've alluded to, it has a wide range of uh, frequencies, and a, therefore a wide range of energies. And you can see here that the wavelength is given. The wavelength is uh, the distance that you travel before the wave repeats itself. So the wavelengths are given. And then you can see the frequency of the wave is also given. The wavelength is up here in this part of the table. As we said, there's an intimate relationship between the frequency of the wave and the energy of the photon. So let's discuss that. Uh, let's get into the, some of the physics of electromagnetic radiation. But before we do that, let's agree upon some definitions. The Greek letter lambda is traditionally used to show wavelength. And the definition of wavelength is if you freeze time and you travel along a wave, the wave will repeat itself in the distance lambda. So for example, if I pick a point here, right here, and I travel along the wave to this point right here, you see the wave repeats itself. So that's lambda, that's the wavelength. I can pick a point up here, so it, picks, it repeats itself here. See how the wave is increasing here, uh, and then over here it's also increasing. So that's a wavelength. So the wavelength is the distance over which, you know, if you were to travel that distance, the wave would repeat itself. So that's part of our thinking of the wave nature of electromagnetic radiation. Now, there's another uh, parameter that we use to characterize the wave, which is the period. And it's the time analog of the wavelength. So the wavelength is the distance over which you have to travel to get the wave to repeat. And the period T is the time you have to wait if you put yourself at some point before the wave will repeat itself. So for example, if I put myself, let's see, that's, I'm going to freeze myself right here, and I'm just going to stay there, and I'm going to watch time go by. So at that point, you can see how the wave is increasing in the negative sense. I'm going to call, I'm going to call all this the positive sense, and this is the negative sense. You can see how the wave is increasing in the negative sense. You can see it increasing. If I were to stand here, I'd see the wave increase as it goes by. Well, that wouldn't happen again until this part of the wave goes by. You see how this is exactly the same. This is exactly the same as this part. So it would take the time t for this part of the wave to once again show up over here. So t is the time it takes the wave to repeat itself if I freeze myself in position. Lambda is the distance it takes for the wave to repeat itself if I freeze time. And these are two parameters that are used by everybody around the world to characterize waves. And electromagnetic radiation is a wave. It has waves, wave properties as a wavelength, as a period. And uh, often we don't use the period, but we use the reciprocal of the period when we talk about waves. And that reciprocal is called the frequency. So often we use the frequency nu. Again, another Greek letter. Well, we talked about 
radiation, electromagnetic radiation, being wave-like, and we just talked about how we characterize it when it is, or since it since it is not when it is, but since it is wave-like, but it also is particle-like, and the relationship was uh, first proposed and uh, by Planck, and uh, then uh, his work uh, in the turn of the century, which, uh, right around the 1900s, the turn of the last century, around the 1900s, his work established this idea that if you take the frequency and multiply it by a constant of nature, h, and then that gave you the energy of the photon. That constant of nature has, has come to be called Planck's constant in honor of his uh, proposing this. He proposed it, Einstein proved he was right, that if you take the frequency, nu, that you see here, multiply it by this constant of nature, that's the energy in the photon. If you use the fact that that uh, that uh, the speed of light is c, electromagnetic radiation goes at the speed of light, and c is equal to lambda times nu. And if you make that change and substitute for nu, you can see that you get c over lambda. So we can both, we can all see there's a c missing from this equation. So that should be hc over lambda if I write Planck's idea in terms of wavelength. So if I write Planck's idea in terms of frequency, h nu is the energy of the photon. If I write Planck's idea in terms of wavelength, then h times the speed of light divided by lambda is the energy of the photon. Electromagnetic radiation travels at the speed of light. Lambda is the wavelength, nu is the frequency. This is thinking of light as a wave, this is thinking of it as a particle. We have to think of it both ways. When light propagates, we often think of it in terms of being a, a, a or, or electromagnetic radiation in general propagates, we think of it as being a wave. When it interacts with matter, whether it's interacting with a semiconductor photodetector or a solar cell or DNA, we think of that interaction in terms of photons. We must. Einstein proved that again back around 1905. Uh, so we must think of light when it interacts with matter in terms of photons. But often when it propagates, we think of it in terms of being a wave. Now we do that because when electromagnetic radiation propagates, and again you'll notice I use the term light and electromagnetic radiation interchangeably. I really shouldn't because Light is just one type of electromagnetic radiation. I should really be saying electromagnetic radiation because all these things we're talking about apply to the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. When it propagates, it can uh, exhibit interference, reflection. So we think of it as, 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 as a wave. But when it interacts with materials, we have to use Planck's and Einstein's idea that it's a particle, the particle's called a photon. Well, here's the spectrum. Again, uh, I apologize for using the word light, because light is only part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Here it is here. Generally, we talk about light right around here. We usually talk about light as being visible light, and a little bit of the infrared we usually call light, a little bit of the ultraviolet we humans generally talk about as being light. And uh, this is the part of the spectrum that our eye has been designed to detect. But it's only part of a huge spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. So again, I shouldn't be using the term light whenever I have. I really should be saying electromagnetic radiation. By the way, electromagnetic radiation is often called E, e and M radiation. E for electric, M for magnetic, so E and M radiation. Up here we see the wavelengths. Wow, the wavelengths can vary from 10 to the 3 meters, which is a rather large distance. What, about 10 to the 2 meters? That's 100 meters. It's about the size of a football field. So that's 10 times the length of a football field is the wavelength. Or it can be all, all the way over here, 
in 10 to minus 12 meters. That's incredibly small. Remember, remember 10 to the minus 9 meters is a nanometer. So this is wavelength is a thousand times smaller than a nanometer. Incredibly small. So you go from something that's 10,000, excuse me, a thousand. This is a thousand times smaller than a nanometer. You can go from something that's a thousand times smaller than a nanometer up to something that's 10 times larger than a football field. That's the breadth of the wavelengths, wavelengths that are available in electromagnetic radiation. Well, we humans have names for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. As I said, we call this the visible, and uh, we talk about the ultraviolet, the infrared. This part we perceive as heat. This part we generally don't perceive, but it leads to sunburn and damage, can lead to damage in the DNA. Uh, this is a very dangerous part. Uh, this part we call soft X-rays. X-rays, obviously, are electromagnetic radiation. This part we call hard X-rays. Uh, these wavelengths up here, and these very short wavelengths over here we call gamma rays. Now if I go the other direction, this is what we call microwaves. You're in your microwave oven at home, and this is what we call out here, and this, these are the radio waves. So I was talking about uh, a thousand times smaller than a nanometer. I was talking about ten times the size of a football field. Here's some other visual images that can give you an idea. This is a soccer field is about the size of a football field. So it's right there. That's about the size of a house for the wavelength. Here the wavelength is about the size of a baseball. Here the wavelength is about the size of this period. Microwave in your microwave oven. Here the wavelength is about the size in the infrared of a cell. Uh, here's a bacteria about the size of a bacterium cell, which is, which is smaller. Here the wavelength is about the size of a virus, which is even smaller. Here the wavelength is about the size of a protein molecule. Here the wavelength is about the size of a water molecule, which is very small. And here the wavelengths are so small, they're down, they're even smaller than about the size of a nucleus, or, well, about that size, the size of a nucleus, so extremely small. Let's talk about the frequency, so remember the wavelength is related to the frequency by the speed of light. We talked about that formula. And then we can talk about the energy of the photons because thanks to Planck and Einstein, we realize that the frequency can be converted into the energy of a photon. And so you see here's the frequency and that E equals H nu has been used for us to, to give us this set of information, the energy of, of a photon. So these are extremely energetic photons. And you can see that the photons in ultraviolet, that's about uh, 10 electron volts. Electron volts is a unit that we're going to use a lot in nanotechnology. Uh, the silicon has a band gap of about one electron volt. This is 10 electron volts. That's a lot of energy that chemical bonds are in this range of energies, the energies that hold molecules together. So you can see why these can break bonds. Well, all of these can, but these uh, are in, in the sunlight. This is dangerous. It can break bonds, and we all know about that. So wavelength, frequency, refer to the wave-like properties. The photon energy refers to the particle-like properties. Uh, here we see some sources of, of electromagnetic radiation, microwave oven, obviously, FM radio station, uh, AM radio stations, radar, people. We emit infrared. I'm sure you know that uh, people use infrared cameras to see people at night. That's because we humans em emit elect uh, electromagnetic radiation in the infrared part of the spectrum. So this is the spectrum. So we emit infrared ourselves. It's how we can be detected at night. Light bulb emits, obviously, in the visible, but also, you know a light bulb is hot, a regular light bulb, so a lot in the infrared also. 
if you go to some of the new light sources, such as uh, LEDs, they're much more efficient. Most of the emission is in the visible. So that's why people were trying to use LEDs instead of incandescent light bulbs. Incandescent light bulbs produce infrared also, as well as visible. We don't really need the infrared. And then you have a synchrotron source can produce x-rays. These are very large facilities. Uh, there are x-ray machines like your dentist has that can produce x-rays. And uh, then uh, nuclear reactions uh, produce these very energetic particles like gamma rays. For example, astronomers look at the uh, universe and try to see where gamma rays are coming from to try to understand some of the things going on out in the universe. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's some interesting physics. We'll be using it uh, in, in our discussions of processing, our discussions of characterization. And right now we're using it in our discussion of safety. We have to be very aware of the safety issues with the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic spectrum. So if we're dealing with radio frequencies, uh, it's used in a lot of processing. I mentioned, I think early on, that it's used in pla uh, to generate plasmas. So there's an electrical source that produces the radio frequency that creates the plasma. So you can have radio frequencies leaking out of the plasma chamber. The plasma itself can produce electromagnetic radiation. As the negative and positive particles combine, they can emit energy themselves. So you can have uh, the radio frequency as well as visible and ultraviolet coming out of a plasma. Um, radiation uh, can be inadvertently emitted if the equipment is not being properly run. And uh, as we said, it's, uh, RF is frequently encountered in plasma sources and uh, uh, long-term exposure to low-level RF radio frequency radiation can present a health hazard. So one has to be aware of that. Microwave radiation, you know where that is in the spectrum now. We're moving towards shorter wavelengths. And uh, it's commonly uh, used in processing in nanofabs at the frequency 2.45 gigahertz. These frequencies, this one and the one that I showed in the previous view graph, are assigned by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. They are assigned for processing. Uh, and so this is a range used in microwave processing in a facility, uh, a laboratory, or a manufacturing facility. And exposure to this radiation can cause damage, for example, uh, to the lens of the eye. Now, microwave radiation, uh, and of course there's a lot of discussion of microwave radiation because of its involvement with cell phones. And so this also ties into safety issues with cell phones. And so you can see the different frequency ranges of this part of the spectrum. This is all microwave, but you can see the frequency uh, ranges, and you can see the different kinds of damage that could occur, internal organs, lens of the eye, outer skin, and skin. Now, laser radiation, we talked about lasers being used for both processing and for characterization. So in the, in the processing case, for example, I mentioned they're being used to scribe, that is cut things, but they're also often used to detect the endpoint of a reaction. And what I mean by that is if you're removing some material, the laser can tell you you've reached the endpoint, that is you removed all the material, because the reflection of the light will change when you go from one material to the other. So if you take away a material and suddenly the laser is hitting a different material, you can detect that event. That is, you can detect the endpoint of the removal of the first material. I mentioned lasers are using characterization equipment. I, I mentioned, for example, Raman spectroscopy. Uh, lasers have to be very carefully watched. It's an intense beam of energy, and, and it can produce retinal lesions. Of course, physicians also use laser beams for uh, operation, so they can be used in a positive way also, but inadvertent exposure can be very dangerous um, and uh, obviously can be very dangerous in the eye 
if they're used or it occurs improperly. Ultraviolet radiation now, if you remember our spectrum, <clears throat> we're moving. We didn't say what radiation frequency we were talking about with the laser because that can be uh, fairly broad, but uh, now we're being definitive and talking about ultraviolet radiation, so we're moving to even shorter wavelengths. And if you recall, these are shorter waves, shorter wave, these have shorter wavelengths than visible light, and uh, it's prevalent in a lot of processing equipment. I mentioned early on that uh, it's used very uh, commonly, in fact I could say it's used all the time in photolithography tools, uh, and you have to be very, very careful of that. And I mentioned also earlier that in plasma processing, when the negative and positive particles combine or, or radicals combine, you can get UV emission photons. UV photons can come off when the positive and negative particles combine or there's uh, radicals that go to lower energy states. So you, you have to be aware that UV can be all around in a fabrication facility in a laboratory and uh, you have to be aware that you can never stare at a UV source without protective goggles and never look through a processing chamber that may have UV uh, emissions not because people want the UV there but because it's a plasma process for example and some of the plasma uh, entities are relaxing in, in, during the processing releasing UV radiation so very, be very, very careful in processing chambers. Don't look through without some kind of a filter in place uh, that is filtering out the UV. Now, infrared, I've jumped backwards here. I've gone, and you remember, visible where it was in the spectrum. Now I've gone to back to longer wave length radiation. And uh, UV uh, was short wavelength. Uh, IR is on the other side of visible, so it's shorter wavelength. I'm sorry, so it's longer wavelength. Uh, UV is shorter, visible, and then the longer is IR. Uh, and IR is used in processing, you'll find processing characterization. It's also used in annealing because it's what we humans call radiative heat. You know, you put your hand near an uh, incandescent light bulb, you can feel the IR waves coming off. Uh, so we think of it as heat. That's what we humans call it. Uh, prolonged exposure to IR can cause burns, obviously, and opacity of the cornea uh, for the eye. Now, OSHA, is a, as we mentioned several times in our lectures, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, has guidelines for this also, and they have radiation protection guidelines, uh, and they look at what kind of exposure levels they believe, based on current understanding and current research, uh, is uh, are what, what levels are tolerable, and, and they have uh, standards for this. So we've talked about energy safety, and uh, we've talked specifically about well, we talked about phys uh, we talked about energy stored in say compressed gas, like in cylinders. But then we talked about energy, electrical energy, and we talked about AC and DC, and then we talked about that electrical energy is used to produce electromagnetic radiation. Sometimes inadvertently it's, it, it, it occurs, sometimes it's used specifically to produce it, and we then went through the electromagnetic spectrum uh, all the way from uh, uh, radio waves all the way to gamma rays, and we talked about, just quickly, I talked about some of the parts of that spectrum of interest and some of their specific safety issues. We also learned some physics, the fact that electromagnetic radiation has to be thought of as both waves and as photons, the latter being the name given to the particles of energy in electromagnetic radiation. Now let's talk about environmental concerns. No discussion of safety uh, is complete without a discussion of the general safety of the population and general, indeed the safety of the whole planet. So the environment can be in, in, impacted by nanofabrication and basically in four ways. It can be impacted when the raw materials are being extracted. It can be impacted during manufacturing. 
the environment can be impacted during use. It can be impacted uh, during the maintenance of the nanoproduct. And it can be impacted during the disposal of the nanoproduct. So let's talk about raw material extraction. So the problems that can arise here are that the chemicals that are being used or produced in the extraction process itself can get into the environment. So for example, let's talk about taking oil and turning it into plastics that we're going to eventually use in some nanoproduct. Well, in that process, we can produce gases that escape into the environment and that can be very detrimental to the environment. Now, nanotechnology is not the only endeavor that does this, but as I've said in earlier lectures, nanotechnology is, uh, to my knowledge, the first branch of technology that is worried from the very beginnings about the impact it can have on the environment. And uh, nanotechnology can cause issues with the environment with the raw material extraction due to the chemicals that are used or produced. Nanotechnology can also cause problems in the raw material extraction because nanoparticles can be generated and these can be produced in the extraction process and get into the environment. And one obvious example of this is mining. Suppose you're mining for silver that you're going to use eventually for silver nanoparticles. Well, you can get a lot of dust into the environment and that can cause safety issues. Um, that's not unique to nanotechnology. Um, dust being caused during, say, a mining process. But nanotechnology is trying to look at this through the whole life cycle of making something. And so we're very concerned about the nanoparticles that can be produced during, during raw material extraction. Now, manufacturing itself can produce problems. It can, again, use chemicals uh, that can uh, be uh, detrimental to the environment. The processing can produce chemicals that can be detrimental to the environment. And we, we discussed this in lecture one. If you go back and think about lecture one, you remember we talked about how to try to scrub uh, nanoparticles, uh, excuse me, not nanoparticles, but chemicals, different kinds of gases. So we're aware of this, and manufacturing uh, considerations must include how can you scrub uh, effluent, and make sure that uh, chemicals that you don't want to get into the environment are indeed not making it into the environment. But this is an issue with manufacturing. Again, not specific to nanotechnology, but one certainly in nanotechnology, certainly an issue to nanotechnology, and one that is nanotechnologists are trying to address from the very beginning. Now also nanoparticles can inadvertently get into the environment during manufacturing. And again, in the early lecture, we talked about scrubbers, this time using scrubbers to capture nanoparticles. Again, we don't want nanoparticles to inadvertently get into the environment now, let me talk about some specific examples of chemicals that can be produced in nanofabrication or can be used in nanofabrication and that can be problematic. So this is, I'm going to look at some specific examples. And the specific example I'm going to pick is the chemicals, the gases, that are called greenhouse gases. Now, the definition of a greenhouse gas is it's a gas that has the capability to trap Infrared radiation, <clears throat> we know what infrared radiation is, that's heat, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Trap part of the infrared radiation that comes from the sun and trap it in the Earth's atmosphere. This obviously can cause problems because it can change the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere. And this trapping of the heat is known as the greenhouse effect for obvious reasons, because greenhouses use glass to trap uh, infrared radiation inside the greenhouse. That's what a greenhouse, gla greenhouse grass, glass does. It traps the infrared radiation from the sun and keeps it inside the greenhouse. Well, unfortunately, there are gases that do the same thing and they keep the energy inside the atmosphere. And here's a, a, a pie chart that shows 
four common greenhouse gases and shows how they make up the pie, which is one of these bad actors, the greenhouse gases. Now you see carbon dioxide. That's found nat naturally, but also we're producing a lot of it through combustion. And it's a greenhouse gas, and you can see there's a lot of it. Uh, it it's a very important greenhouse gas. Now fluorocarbons, those are other, another type of greenhouse gas. These are ones that are definitely 100%, well, just about 100%, due to humans. And these come from our using them in processing, microprocessing them to make uh, circuits, uh, nanofabrication to make nano products, but also in uh, air conditioning refrigerants and uh, in refrigerators. Uh, the latter use, refrigerators and air conditioners, has been banned in the U.S., so we're trying to decrease the number of fluorocarbons. And their use in nanofabrication has um, also been greatly decreased. Uh, so we're trying to control that type of greenhouse gas. Methane, again, uh, comes uh, from uh, human activity, but it's also, uh, uh, it also comes from natural activity. The nitrous oxide comes from human activity, uh, but also some uh, well, human activity and natural activity. So we're affecting every one of these greenhouse gases. But methane, let's talk more about methane. Large quantities of methane are created by livestock, coal mining, organic decay, drilling for oil and natural gases, and uh, human uh, activities such as processing to try to get hydrogen. So methane, CH4, is obviously a great source of hydrogen, and hydrogen is needed for many, many types of processing steps. So methane, which is a natural gas, uh, is a source of hydrogen, but then methane gets released into the atmosphere as it's being used. Nitrous oxide, uh, it's used in, it shows up because of the nitrogen-based fertilizers, it shows up because of sewage treatment plants, it shows up in automobile exhausts, and in general, in any kinds of processing where nitrogen and oxygen are needed, such as fertilizer, for example, fertilizer production. Now, the fluorocarbons, uh, I mentioned uh, these two as being uh, bad actors, if you will, uh, and they come in, in two forms, chlorofluorocarbons and uh, hydrofluorocarbons. And uh, they're generally very popular sources of fluorine. And fluorine is used in processing, uh, in nanofabrication, microfabrication, because fluorine is the most chemically reactive element in the universe. So if you're trying to remove something, fluorine's a good way to do it. So fluorocarbons are very interesting, very useful in processing. The chlorofluorocarbons uh, have been used in aerosol cans, air conditioners, refrigerators, I mentioned these things. Uh, and in, they've been used in micro and nanofabrication for etch and deposition gases. Uh, and you can see here a website where, from the University of Michigan where you can learn more about these materials. So those are some examples of some of the specific chemicals that are produced in nanofabrication that we have to be very aware of and we have to control. Now let's talk about the adverse effects that can come from the use and maintenance of a nano product. Well, in the normal wear and tear of a product, uh, you can liberate particles. And in the maintenance of a product, you can also liberate particles. Let me give you an example of how just using a product can liberate particles. There is a very large uh, company that makes uh, washing machines that have uh, uh, a source of, of uh, silver in them. Uh, and that silver has been found to be uh, released into the atmosphere, and uh, there's some argument that it's released in unacceptable levels, and that silver then goes into the affluent, the water, uh, it eventually makes itself way into water, uh, and it's been argued that it can kill algae. Silver is used in the washing machines because it's 
antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, but once it gets into the atmosphere, it can kill things like algae. Obviously, algae is not much different than fungus and, and uh, bacteria and what have you that you can find in your washing machine. It can kill the algae, which then can affect the whole food chain. So here's an example of just using a nanoproduct that can be detrimental. Uh, so we have to watch this sort of uh, situation. What happens in the use of the product? What happens in the maintenance of the product? Uh, so nanoparticles, you know, let's just, let's just focus on nanoparticles for a minute. They're all around us in nature. They're found in the minerals and in, in, in water. If you go to a, a stream or a river, there are particles in the water that come from the natural erosion process. And these can be in the nanoscale. And they're in the air from forest fires, natural forest fires caused by lightning. They're in the air from things like volcanoes. So nano, we, we, humans have been living with nanoparticles for a long time. The problem is that right now, most of the nanoparticles in the atmosphere are coming from humans. Uh, and they're not coming from nanotechnology. 60% of them are coming from road transport. In other words, when trucks and cars go up and down roads, little bits of the tires come off, and little pieces of concrete, whatever, nanoparticles are being produced. And you might want to go to this uh, nanoform source and look into this further. So we humans are producing a lot of nanoparticles, but not because of nanotechnology. We're producing them, well, 60% of them are just driving up and down our roads. And an additional 20% are coming from other human causes, such as combustion. And a big source is power stations. Uh, and these are producing a lot of nanoparticles. So nanotechnology per se, that is nanotechnology itself, is not producing anywhere near the majority or not even anywhere near a significant number of nanoparticles. Humans and Mother Nature, humans and other activities in Mother Nature are producing all these nanoparticles. But thanks to nanotechnology, we can see and we can now see these nanoparticles. Nanotechnology has created all these characterization tools, all these ways of seeing things that we now can see these particles and we now know they're around. We've been experiencing them since we started messing with fire and started breathing anywhere near a volcano, but now we can see these nanoparticles thanks to nanotechnology. But they're there, we have to be aware of them, and we, ha we have to make sure that nanotechnology does not contribute any significant number to what's flying around. This uh, view graph uh, shows you what is flying around, and uh, as you can see, it shows the road sources of nanoparticles, it shows uh, industrial plants, now, these can be power plants, these are producing nanoparticles, they get into the air, they interact with the sun, there can be some further chemical reactions, they can be, somebody can breathe them, get into their lungs, they can get into the water supply, and they can affect the water supply, and thereby the food chain. Now in addition, then you have additional so this is the road tra traffic, this is the power plants. In addition, you have a contribution from manufacturing, which we said was very, very small. And then the consumer, the wear and tear we were talking about. Then you have to worry about how you're going to dispose of these things. We don't want to put more in. So nanotechnology, per se, is only a small part of this issue. And we're, those of us who are practitioners, are very aware of all of this, and very uh, aware of the fact that we cannot let nanotechnology itself be a significant source of nanoparticles in the environment. But right now there are other very significant dominating sources, and here they are, of nanoparticles in the environment. So disposal, just to complete this way, these four or five ways that nanotechnology can uh, affect the environment, disposal is one way. We can put nanoparticles directly into the ecological system when we're dis disposing of the nanoparticles. And again, we have to be careful that when we dispose of nanoparticles, we don't put them 
get them into the water, we don't get them into the air. So we have to be very careful about that in disposal. Now, those of us who are pra practitioners of nanotechnology are very aware of this whole issue of life cycle of a nanoproduct. So we talked about the fact that there can be problems with extraction of raw materials. We talked about that there can be manufacturing problems where particles can uh, escape. We talked about the fact that there can be uh, escape of nanoparticles during use and maintenance. And then we talked about the fact that there can be problems in disposal. So we're constantly worrying of, well, first of all, we're very aware of these things. As I said, much more than any technology that man has invented up till now. Uh, I think the neat thing about nanotechnology is we've been worrying about these things from the beginning. And so people are looking at, well, how do you take products and not dispose of them, but, but reuse them? How do you take products and not dispose of them, but recover part of the product? And uh, do you have to go to just disposal and incineration? Are there ways that you can use recovery? Are there ways that you can use release? Uh, excuse me, reuse. So these are very important issues in nanotechnology as we worry about the safety to people and we worry about the overall safety to the environment and the planet. Well, we have talked a lot about safety. In today's lecture, we did energy safety and we did environmental concerns. And in this unit, we've covered general safety awareness, we had chemistry safety and gas safety. That was lecture one, biological safety and nanomaterial safety. That was lecture two. And today's lecture, lecture three, as I said, we covered energy safety and environmental concerns.